Hi, I'm Manika Raman Wilms, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. While we've been working hard to get COVID under control, a different health threat has been silently growing in Canada. Sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, are up across the country. Between 2020 and 2021, gonorrhea cases increased by 400 percent in New Brunswick alone. And these infections can have long-lasting consequences. With many of these infections being asymptomatic, you leave this aside for too long and you leave it untreated for too long. And there's sort of long-term risks, especially for women. Globe reporter Zosha Bielski joins us to explain why we're seeing this rise in STIs, what we can do about it, and how you can protect yourself. This is The Decibel. Zosha, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Manika. So how did you first come across the rise in STI rates in, in Canada? So I've been part of a sort of a sociology team that's been covering COVID for the last two years. And it sort of allowed us to sort of explore the human side and the collateral damage of this pandemic in every other sphere of our lives. And, you know, I, I would always ask that journalist question at the end of my interviews, what else should be on my radar? And, and regardless of sort of the sources I was speaking with in the sexual health and gender realms, um, this concern would come up that we've allowed sexual health education and testing to completely fall by the wayside or largely fall by the wayside over the last Mm -hmm. two years and that we were going to see fallout because this notion that uh, everybody was sort of, you know, hunkering down at home, that may have been the case for the worst of our lockdowns, but two years in, it certainly hasn't been the case. And are there specific regions in Canada that are seeing these these spikes in STIs or, or where are we seeing this increase in Canada? So there are sort of pockets across Canada. Syphilis is of particular concern. We're seeing that rage across Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, BC, Northwest Territories, Ontario. We've got 2,658 new cases, the most in a decade. Alberta has gotten much of the press on this in Saskatchewan. But we're also seeing things like gonorrhea up really starkly in New Brunswick and Newfoundland. Uh, HIV also up in Saskatchewan. So you have certain infections spiking in in certain parts of the country. And uh, we suspect many more. But, you know, with the question of data and lack of testing, uh, we still don't have the complete picture. But what we do see is alarming. And what about the the demographics here? Like, is this across all, all age groups then? The demographics of concern that we're sort of seeing are younger ages up to 39. Um, Syphilis, for example, is 30 to 39, scaling a bit older. But for the rest of them, we're really looking at uh, people in their 20s. Okay. And so I guess, yeah, the question is, why is this happening now? Why are the conditions in the pandemic causing this spike in STIs? So what we're seeing in terms of the last two years is uh, fall off in sexual health education for those in school, fall off in testing with a lot of healthcare workers redeployed to COVID and fall off in treatment. So, you know, when you put all that together, less detection equates with more spread. Yeah, let's go to this point on testing then, because you said, you know, the pandemic is really exacerbating this this issue that was already there already. Uh, we've seen, for example, in a lot of other health services, we've seen a drop in cancer screenings uh, during the pandemic because resources are being diverted elsewhere. Is that kind of a similar case for testing for STIs? Exactly. So the concerns that you've seen in other realms of our health sort of falling by the wayside are, are have crept in with sexual health testing as well. So the Public Health Agency of Canada actually surveyed as many you know providers as they could across the country, people who look at sexual health. 45% of them said that their ability to test for STIs decreased throughout the pandemic. Uh, 31% said it all but halted at moments in, in the past two years. HIV testing, 44% said that decreased at some point in time, you know, less access to treatment, uh, viral load monitoring in the case of HIV. So 25% actually also said that their staffing levels had dropped precipitously in the pandemic. And, Mm. you know, 10 months in, they still weren't fully restaffed. So those are some of the things that are happening with service providers in the pandemic. And so if people aren't getting tested, 
but people are still having sex. It sounds like STIs are, are being transmitted here. Is it possible that these numbers then are actually higher than we think because people just don't know that they're sick? That's the fear that um, even where you may see some decrease in numbers, take that with a grain of salt because um, the testing portrait is so incomplete right now. And with a lot of these STIs being completely or largely asymptomatic, unless you're sort of proactively tested, um, you know, during a pap smear or during another visit with your healthcare provider, you may not know you're carrying this and, and maybe passing it on to other partners unknowingly. And, you know, you mentioned that, that you worry that this is not an incomplete data picture. You know, places like Nova Scotia and Quebec actually told me they don't have data for two years for STIs, mm -hmm. 2020 and 2021, um, because of the, the halts in testing. So they weren't wow. even able to provide me with any data for two years. Quebec says some data is forthcoming. Places like PEI didn't even bother to respond to my, my requests um, for data. So the picture is troublingly uh, incomplete. I guess the, the basic question here is HIV isn't the death sentence that it, that it used to be. Syphilis and a lot of these other uh, infections are, are curable quite easily now. Should people really be worried about getting an STI? Things like gonorrhea, chlamydia and syphilis, you know, very, very treatable. Syphilis, um, one shot of penicillin if you, if you catch it in the early stages, gonorrhea, chlamydia, antibiotics readily available. But again, with many of these infections being asymptomatic, you leave this aside for too long and you leave it untreated for too long. And there's sort of long-term risks, especially for women. Chlamydia untreated can cause pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, infertility. Women may not even know that they've even had chlamydia until they're at, at the fertility clinic. Uh, same thing with gonorrhea, infertility and pelvic uh, inflammatory risks for women. Um, and syphilis obviously comes with a host of cardiovascular and neurological consequences if it's left untreated. So it's, it's sort of a pivotal time to get checked out um, so that these things don't cause longer term damage in the body. Okay, yeah. So this has been on the rise for a number of years then. Uh, can, can we break that down a little bit? And can you explain those things in a bit more detail? So one of the pieces of context that I got through my sources was that the rises that we're seeing right now are sort of an intensification of a two decades plus long trend of increasing STIs. And the large scale reasons there are, you know, have much to do with um, declining condom use, the other reason is sort of um, better contraception. If you think about safe sex education and the safer sex messaging a lot of us got in school, uh, I'm in my 40s, for example, uh, much of it focused on HIV. So we did see really good declines in STIs sort of in the 90s when that message was really hammered home. Then with the advent of things like PrEP, which is a prevention method, and antiretrovirals, uh, which allow, you know, those who have HIV to, you know, their viral loads drop to a point that it's uh, untransmissible and undetectable. As these technologies and health advances, you know, came to us, that disease became, you know, a chronic condition and not a death sentence. Some of our anxieties around went by the wayside, as did the condom use. So you have a whole generation for whom, you know, HIV isn't the same story as it was for, for the rest of us. And then, you know, the secondary issue, which is a, is a better news story, is, um, you know, advance in contraception, access to contraception, warning after pills. So you've got all of that in the backdrop with rates steadily increasing over the last 20 years. And then the whammy of the pandemic with, you know, public health units completely redeployed to deal with with this crisis. And, and some of those haven't been actually returned to pre-pandemic levels. So um, and testing all but stopping throughout various lockdowns or access sort of greatly hampered. When it comes to testing for STIs, I mean, I think we, we're trying to make this a more comfortable topic of conversation, but like there's still some stigmatization around this. I would imagine, you can tell me if you found this in your reporting or not, Zosha, but like during the pandemic when we're being told to lock down and limit our circles, does this kind of increase the stigma here if you think you're you're sick because you've been having sex in a lockdown? Exactly. You're, you're completely right. People sort of described a double stigma. Um, not only is this something you're loath to, to raise with your family doctor on a, you know, in a normal period of time, but especially in lockdowns when when various public health authorities offered really sort of strict edicts on not having casual sex, not meeting with strangers to have to then sort of acknowledge to your physician um, that, that you've been having casual sex and, and unprotected sex uh, 
in a lockdown scenario um, that just was not an appetizing route for many people, hmm. if they could even find anyone to test them, right? We've heard a lot about um, family doctors still refusing to see people in person because they want to do their <laughs> appointments virtually. And, you know, one of the other things my sources described was this idea of the COVID fatigue bleeding into this other area of health. We've been on guard about our health for two years and to have to convince people to now be on guard about this other element of their health, it's it's sort of a tall order. Um, people are so tired of it. So right now, what, what PHAC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, is encouraging all doctors to do is to, to screen anybody under the age of 30 who's sexually active every year for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And, you know, people like the chief medical officer of health um, for New Brunswick, Dr. Jennifer Russell, said the motto should be test for one, test for all. So if you're testing for one thing, convince your patient to be tested for all sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. So we're talking HIV, AIDS, Hep C, Hep B, uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and so on. So that's the going push right now. What about other services like uh, for treatment and prevention, like handing out free condoms, for example? Are, are those kinds of things still happening during the pandemic? Again, a lot of that resource got redeployed, um, limited hours, limited access to appointments. People said sort of only in emergencies. So we certainly had gaps there. And one of the interesting things that I heard in Saskatchewan from a, a woman named Natalia Mason, she's an educator with Saskatoon uh, Sexual Health. She said, actually, though, the price of condoms um, went up precipitously due to supply chain issues once again. Really? Um, huh. So they used to buy a big lot of uh, 150,000 condoms for, th- I believe it was $13,000. And now that's shot up to $19,000. You know, even things like this, there's reverberations um, that have to do with the pandemic. Yeah, we've been hearing about supply chain issues for a, a long time now from groceries to all kinds of products we buy. So now it's, it's hitting the condoms as well. Yeah, sadly, yeah. How have different levels of government in Canada reacted to to the spike in STI numbers? Like usually health is a, a provincial thing. So has there been a government response to try to tackle this? Absolutely. I think, you know, there are some campaigns now surfacing on the ground as, as governments begin to shift their focus away from COVID. Um, I sort of start my piece with a gonorrhea campaign in New Brunswick. It was sort of aimed at 20 to 39 year olds uh, living in cities, which is the cohort that's sort of been hit with gonorrhea. It's, it's five times up between 2021 and 2020, triple in the first months of this year compared to last. So we're dealing with waves of outbreaks. So, you know, they're doing things like taking to Instagram, TikTok, Tinder, the dating site. They're sort of geotagging local bars, um, doing advertising in those areas um, with sort of catchy campaigns. I think one of them has a creaky bed in the background. Just doing whatever they can to sort of blast this cohort um, with a cautionary message. And are other places uh, like like the United States, are other places seeing this rise in STIs as well? We've been seeing some early research, uh, some early signs that this is this is happening internationally as well, along with those long term declines in condom use, the same backdrop. So Canada is certainly not alone. We mentioned sex ed a little bit earlier, Zosha. Uh, are, are high schoolers and young people being taught about this rise in STIs and, and how to prevent them? Yeah, that's something that I've got a little bit of alarm on as well from my sources. They, they said like, even in good times, sex ed is sort of gets the lowest priority in schools. And, and what they found was as learning went virtual, sexual health education was often uh, sort of overlooked because there was so much else to deal with. The other thing that happened was um, a lot of learning in health uh, focused on mental health, obviously supporting, you know, kids and young people through this pandemic crisis. So some of the sources I spoke to said, like, students haven't gotten this crap of sex ed in two years. Um, other places did incorporate virtual sex ed, um, which sort of worked better for some students because they weren't sitting in a classroom and all of its embarrassments. But for some students, that's not really an option, depending on who your parents are and how how open they are about this stuff and how much privacy you have at home. So there's a, a clear sense that this the sex ed gap is going to factor in to the sexually transmitted infections issue. So I guess lastly, the, the question is, what should a sexually active person be doing now in order to protect themselves? 
they should get tested first and foremost. They should test for one, test for all, um, call it a spring tune-up, whatever you want to call it. Um, oh my God. I think I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> Car metaphors. <laughs> um, but get over the embarrassment and get tested and, and value your sexual health the same way you do, you know, the other facets of your health. So that's the message we're hearing now. Sosha, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. That's it for today. I'm Manika Raman Wilms. Allie Graham helped edit this episode. Our producers are Madeline White and Cheryl Sutherland. David Crosby edits the show. Kasia Mihailovich is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.